Hi, this is Larry Hupp and I'm a medical consultant at ProLab Orthotics and today we're going to do a short webinar here on orthotic therapy for tarsal tunnel syndrome. Um, as you well know, the presentation is going to be pain in the proximal medial arch, paresthesias along lateral and medial plantar nerves. Um, it's also often associated with a pronated foot and this was described way back in 1962 by Keck. The pathology is hypothesized to be either traction on the tibial nerve by, and compression by the flexor retinaculum or compression of the medial plantar nerve as it perforates through the fascia. Treatment, again, as you know, is going to um, range from conservative treatments such as strapping, orthoses, NSAIDs, injection therapy, and um, up through surgical decompression. Now, so we're going to start looking at, at how orthotic therapy might affect tarsal tunnel syndrome. I think it's really important to point out that there's really no specific clinical outcome studies that document the effectiveness of orthotics for tarsal tunnel syndrome. There is, however, evidence that tarsal tunnel syndrome is associated with excessively pronated feet. And there's fairly recent re literature on the pathomechanics of tarsal tunnel syndrome that indicate how mechanical control with orthotics might be beneficial for these patients. And it even gives us some, some guidance on exactly how these orthotic prescriptions should be written. So let's look at some of the literature here. We're going to look at several studies. First one is a study on tarsal tunnel intercompartment pressure by Tretman. Study on the heel pain triad by Labib, and a study on the dorsiflexion eversion test by Kenishita. We're going to use these to, again, determine how we might think about writing an orthotic prescription to reduce the symptoms of tarsal tunnel syndrome. So let's first look at that Tretman study, looking at tarsal tunnel pressure versus foot position. What he did is he measured the anatomic space pressure in the tarsal tunnel with the foot in various positions using fresh frozen cadavers. So he did this. He, he put the foot in a neutral position with mild plantar flexion, and he measured the compartment pressure. He put the foot in an everted heel position with mild dorsiflexion uh, measured pressure, and then finally in an inverted heel position with mild dorsiflexion. And this is what he found. That full eversion, again, that more pronated foot, caused the greatest increase in tarsal tunnel pressure, and quite significantly, full inversion also increased tarsal tunnel pressure, but mild plantar flexion, and fairly neutral as far as the amount of eversion, was uh, quite low on the level of uh, tarsal tunnel pressure, com especially compared to that full eversion position. So the results here show that increased tarsal tunnel pressure occurred when the STJ, the subtalar joint, was pronated, that you had reduced tarsal tunnel pressure with mild foot inversion and plantar flexion. It supports the hypothesis that increased pressure within the tarsal tunnel uh, is going to occur when the foot everts um, and also, again, when it inverts, and that can aggravate posterior tibial nerve entrapment. So now let's look at the heel pain triad. This was described by Labib in uh, Foot and Ankle International. Uh, he had close to 300 patients that had heel pain for over three years and identified 14 of those patients that were diagnosed and eventually surgically treated for a combination of plantar fasciitis, posterior tibial tendonitis, and tarsal tunnel syndrome. That what he did is he ended up correlating a collapse of the longitudinal arch in these patients to tarsal tunnel symptoms. He postulated that the lack of muscular support of the longitudinal arch produces traction injury to the tibial nerve and results in tarsal tunnel syndrome. Another way to put it is that arch collapses and as that lengthens, you increase tension on the tarsal nerve leading to these symptoms. Finally, we have the dorsiflexion eversion test for tarsal tunnel syndrome is described by Kinoshita. What he was looking for is a better way to diagnose tarsal tunnel syndrome, and he did so by non-weight bearing positioning of the subtalar joint. So he had 50 normal subjects, 50 subjects with no symptoms, and then 43 subjects that were treated operatively eventually for tarsal tunnel syndrome. He did testing both pre and post-op. So this test is very simple. You simply hold the foot in maximal dorsiflexion and inversion for about 5 to 10 seconds. And here's what he found. 
is that local tenderness increased in 42 of those 43 patients that uh, were eventually diagnosed with tarsal tunnel syndrome when doing this test. Tenel sign increased in 41 out of 43 of these patients. And Tenel's was actually induced in three of the patients that had no symptoms, so that, those 50 normal subjects. Um, so this is, these are interesting findings and really do show that the dorsiflexion and eversion seems to uh, increase tarsal tunnel syndrome symptoms probably by increasing tension on the tarsal nerve. And basically confirms that a positive Kinoshita test or a dorsiflexion eversion test is very accurate in identifying tarsal tunnel pathology. So now let's summarize this literature and kind of relate it to orthotic therapy. So first of all, we know that a, a lack of longitudinal arch support tends to lead to tarsal tunnel syndrome as described by Labib. Subtalar joint pronation produces tarsal tunnel sim symptoms as shown by Kinoshita. And subtalar joint pronation increases tarsal tunnel pressure as Tretman showed. And then plantar flexion and decreased eversion actually decreased tarsal tunnel pressure, again, as shown by Tretman. So, as this relates to orthotic therapy, I think based on the summary here, is that orthotic therapy for tarsal tunnel syndrome should be effective if it can do one of three things or do this these combination. Support the longitudinal arch, decrease eversion of the heel, and slightly plantar flex the ankle joint. So now let's look at our orthotic prescription. We're going to look at several things here. We're going to look at the material itself. We'll look at the size of the orthotic. We'll look at positive cast work, posting, top covers, forefoot extensions, and then any special additions we might add to the orthotic. The, the material itself isn't all that critical, I meaning it doesn't matter probably whether you use polypropylene or graphite. The key is that the material has to be rigid enough to resist deformation. If it deforms or flattens under the foot, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be difficult for that orthosis to position the foot in a manner that would decrease tension on the plantar fascia, or I'm sorry, on the, on the tarsal nerve, or to decrease compression within the tarsal canal. Next thing we want to think about is probably doing a wider than average orthosis or at least doing a wide orthosis uh, and a deeper heel cup. The idea here is we want to put more force medial to the subtalar joint axis because when we apply force medial to that axis, we are going to apply a supinatory torque around the subtalar joint, right? It help keep it from excessive pronation. What we're looking at here is a more neutral foot. Uh, here is a representation of a pes planus or a more pronated foot. As the, as the foot pronates, the, the leg and the talus uh, it, uh, internally rotate. And as the talus internally rotates, that subtalar joint axis moves with the talus medial. And so on these flatter feet, we really have a much smaller area in which we can apply force to resist excessive pronation. So that's where we want to do a wider orthosis and a deeper orthosis uh, so it can apply force medial to that subtalar joint axis. So again, we'll do a wide orthotic shell. And we'll use a deeper than average heel cup. Okay, if we can go up a little bit higher here, we can apply force medial to the axis and help limit eversion of the heel. And as we saw, eversion of the heel seems to increase tarsal tunnel symptoms. We want to prevent arch collapse. So we're going to make an orthosis that conforms very close to the arch of the foot. We do that by prescribing a minimum cast fill, right? What we're looking at here on these negative casts um, is, I'm sorry, these positive casts is that those that have the minimum amount of extra plaster, the, the white here, are those that are going to they're going to uh, produce an orthosis that conforms the closest to the arch of the foot, and that's going to help provide, prevent arch collapse, which prevents the foot from getting longer, which helps to reduce tension on the tarsal nerve. We're also going to use a positive castwork modification called the medial heel skive. It is a wedge built into the heel cup of the orthosis that shifts the center of force farther medial to the subtalar joint axis and again applies a greater supinatory torque around the subtalar joint axis, helping to limit excessive pronation. And again, we can use a deeper heel cup. By using that deeper heel cup, we can apply more force medial to the subtalar joint axis. Finally, we will use a rear foot post to help stabilize the orthosis in the shoe. 
It also gives us a platform to apply a heel lift, which is the next thing we're going to do here. And we're going to use that heel lift, um, as we showed in the Tretman study, that plantar flex in the ankle joint seems to decrease pressure within the tarsal tunnel. So here's a sample prescription you might think about writing for next time you make an orthotic for a patient with tarsal tunnel syndrome. For material, maybe a semi-rigid polypropylene. There are other materials you could use also, but again, this is a good one that is easy to work with, easy to adjust, but um, gives enough rigidity to support the foot. A wide width, a deep heel cuff, a minimum cast fill, a six millimeter medial heel skive to limit heel eversion, a flat rear foot post, and a heel lift. So the take home on this is that to decrease tension on the tarsal nerve, you want to prescribe an orthotic device that slightly supinates the subtalar joint, supports the medial arch, and slightly plantar flexes the ankle joint. We have a lot of resources available on our website at prolaborthotics.com. We also have information on a couple great books on orthotic therapy. Uh, if you're a ProLab client, if you have any questions on, on specific patients, you're certainly welcome to contact us and talk to one of our medical consultants. Uh, thanks for watching. If you need to contact us, here's the information in front of you.